Good afternoon, I'm Karen Holmes Ward. The U.S.-Mexico border is more than a thousand miles away, but the steady stream of immigration and asylum seekers has been straining available resources in the Boston area, and organizations designed to address their needs are scrambling to help. Joining us now is Gladys Vega. She's the executive director of La Collaborativa in Chelsea. And Dr. Gerald Gabo, executive director of Immigrant Family Services Institute in Mattapan. Gladys, let's start with you. Uh, in the Northeast, New York is getting the headlines with buses coming in from border states with immigrants looking for help. But Massachusetts is also seeing a stark increase in arrivals. How have you been handling that? So thank you for having me. I think that the best way that we've been handling is um, reaching out, opening the doors of La Colaborativa for everyone that comes in. We try our best to create bags of resources. We do legal clinics. We do as much as we can to welcome them and offer them essential services, such as vaccinations. Many of them have not been vaccinated. Others are in need of just essentials. Um, it could be food, it could be um, gift cards to stop and shop or market basket. So, and we get ready with also the school department because many of them have, many of the children have never gone to school. So making sure that the director of the parent information center is aware when we send them large amounts of families so that they can register for school. Mm. Now, many may not know that Boston is home to the third largest concentration of Haitians and Haitian Americans in the United States. The halls of area hospitals like Boston Medical Center have been filling with migrants with nowhere else to go when they first arrive in Boston. And this isn't really a new problem. Gerald, uh, uh, Five Investigates' Karen Anderson spoke with two families your organization helped last fall. And this is for you and Sophie. From Haiti to Chile, and then mostly on foot to Mexico, she traveled through 12 countries before coming to Boston. She's part of a wave of Haitians fleeing violence, but her arrival here was anything but easy. Okay, when they first got here, they slept at the airport. The kindness of strangers helped her at the airport, where someone bought her the suitcase to replace her ripped bag. Another stranger got her an Uber to Boston Medical Center because her daughter was sick. But when they were medically discharged, there was nowhere to go. How long were you in the hospital? Okay, she spent over a week at the hospital. Marie says she was living in a room at BMC with 10 or 11 other Haitian immigrants with no shelters available. Robert and his daughter, along with his wife and three-month-old, went to BMC after arriving in Boston and his wife felt sick. They ended up spending seven days there. He says he slept on the floor. How bad was it for you? Be confined to one room and watching the reaction of his kids not being happy and suffering and, uh, and you know, of hunger and, and, and not being comfortable in the room really made him sad. Gerald, what happens to families in these situations? So we uh, welcome everyday families like this one. And uh, so often from the airport, they come directly to our office in Malapen. And what we do, we always try to, you know, find resources for them like housing, helping them with all of the form that they need to fill. So the good news with this family is that we are able to help them fill out all of their paperwork for work authorization. Now they are able to go to work, they are able to find an apartment where they can live uh, as a way for us to really continue to open doors to others. And we are so uh, blessed to see angels all around helping those who are less fortunate, who are the most vulnerable, so that they can find a way in this country. So we are so pleased to say that, yes, this family is still here and also making their way to become independent. Gladys, Massachusetts is housing migrants in hotels around the state. We reported about 130 Haitian families living in a Taunton hotel, and families are being housed in a Salem State University dorm with plans to convert other state facilities into temporary housing. Give us a sense of the housing crisis specifically that you're addressing. So the housing crisis is bad for people that are already living here in overcrowded conditions. But there's some magic that happens when the human beings want to help each other. So I think, you know, although we are having a real hard time making sure that people are have access to shelters because pretty much they may not qualify. And when they qualify, 
there's a wait list, right? So what we've been doing is asking people to see if they can house some of the members of newcomers that we've been having and allowing them to stay for a couple of weeks until we find more permanent housing with the understanding that at times that permanent housing could be a wait for like three months and that individual is in this house of a stranger mm. creating at times a little bit more hardships to the other family. So what we've been doing instead is providing essential resources, making sure that we help with the rent, that we help with the utility payments, that we help in whatever way we can. But understanding that housing continues to be a crisis in Massachusetts, in Chelsea and surrounding communities, and the price of housing has gone up so sure. drastically sure. that we're feeling the impact of it. So, uh, Gerald, uh, tell us more about the services that your organization is providing. So we are called the One Stop Service Center for Haitian Migrants, and meaning that from the day that they arrive, we welcome them, we help them with all of their, you know, paperwork in terms of, you know, myself, DTA, you know, just, you know, uh, work authorization, legal work. It's whatever that they need. So we have this one-stop model where we provide them all of the service in, just services in one place. Housing remains a big challenge. So if she has rented over 100 units over the past year to house uh, families. So it, it is one of the biggest challenge that we have. And we are talking to the state, we are talking to the city as a way for them to step up and find creative ways to house those families. Joelle, can you speak to what you think the United States needs to do about the crisis in Haiti uh, so, to, to stop so many people from leaving? Exactly. One thing that I always said is that as, as long as the situation in Haiti remains the way it is, we are going to see this massive influx of Haitians coming because currently with the gang violence in Haiti, with the inaction of the U.S., basically completely silence about the situation in Haiti, there is no way for people to stay in Haiti. So we want the U.S. to really stand up and say that, yes, I am with you and I'm going to do whatever it takes to support you. We do not produce ga uh, guns. And for us to have so many guns in our street, it's almost unbelievable. So we want the U.S. to step up and say no in terms of shipping guns to Haiti and allow the country to be destroyed the way that it is right now. Is it too late for the United States to help stabilize what's happening in Haiti? It's never too late. It's just a matter of be willing to do something. Because currently, the way it is, it feels like, you know, it's like it, Haiti is nothing, and nobody's paying attention to the uh, magnitude of the crisis in Haiti. It is not too late. We need to come together at the table with uh, people who care about this country and do something. Because if we stop, you know, sending guns to Haiti, if we stop sending all of the bullets to Haiti, guess what? The crisis will stop because it's a matter of, you know, stopping, you know, those guns to come to the country. Yes. To, so that people so we, can can't, we just can't give up. Gladys, I, I want to ask you, uh, there are many people who've been here who've, who've lost jobs and for whom housing is just becoming too expensive, inflation is increasing, the price of food. What is the path forward to help? I think it's creating, like La Colaborativa is also one of those organizations, those few organizations that, rule, that do wraparound services. So employment, training, ESL classes, a path to citizenship, a, a path to some type of legalization, making sure that people get a good paying job because a minimum wage is not longer affordable anymore. If you make a minimum wage, you're not able to make it in Massachusetts. We need to have a livable wage in order for us to address the, the crisis. I mean, we are facing an economic crisis. Right after the pandemic, the situation has gotten much, much worse, and the prices continue to go up. Mm. In the meantime, yes. not everyone is back to work. Yeah, Gladys uh, uh, Vega, uh, Executive Director of La Colorbativa in Chelsea, and Dr. Gerald Gabo, Executive Director of the Immigrant Family Services Institute. Thanks for all you're doing, and thanks for joining us.